Well, our next speaker is Carol Matriciano. And Carol was born in India. And of course, as you know, the India is sort of the center of much of the uh, occult new age. We always hear the stories of people walking on, uh, on burning embers or uh, the, 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 the rope trick where the rope goes up in the sky or the, the snake charmers. And, and we sort of scoff at a lot of these things, but uh, you shouldn't really scoff at them because there really is something uh, there is an occult element which is part of the life in India. And uh, that's, of course, one reason why human life uh, is so really uh, unimportant over there, at least as far as the attitude of the people. Anyway, of course, uh, Carol, uh, coming from a military family, was involved with uh, life over there, eventually went to England, was involved in the occult, and then, of course, she became a Christian, uh, came to the United States, and she's a film producer. We carry a number of her films, and those of you who haven't been to her table over there, let me suggest that we, we carry the films, but we hope today why you want to get them, Carol. She does a magnificent job. She's put out some of the uh, most important information on, on this spiritual warfare uh, that we were involved in today. And certainly Michael Shaw alluded to that spiritual warfare in the first hour, and now we're going to develop uh, a great deal more by one of the world's leading experts on this, Carol Matriciata. Please welcome her. Thank you, Dr. Sven. Thank you so much. Well, <clears throat> thank you, um, Dr. Stan, for making this possible. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Letitia, for everything you've done over the years. Dr. Stan and the team, Barbara and Letitia, have been such a support to me. And I thank them so much because uh, while I consider myself in the um, um, arms manufacturing business of spiritual warfare, <laughs> I need my little foot soldiers all around the place to take out the um, grenades and the tools that take about two, three years to make. Each film is uh, stacked with research. I go to the sources, to the various countries, and um, so it's really important for you to get the films out into the marketplace and uh, help educate um, the people that I'm trying to reach with the various topics. Um, I've been in the filmmaking business for over 25 years. Um, I've made over 53, actually coming up to almost 55 documentaries now on all sorts of topics, um, a lot of social, contemporary issues. And, um, and of course, as Dr. Stan line religions and then the offshoots and the uh, sects and the cults, if you will, the deviants. Um, and all of this to understand and put it into the larger context. And I thank Michael so much for his talk this morning because while he talked about this huge, almost terrifying concept of political espionage and what they do, the, the kernel of it is new language in order to get us to new think. And I think this is a very important concept to understand that we are the targets of deception. And as long as our minds can be twisted to sort of think all of this is reasonable, then we fall prey to the deception. So my films are basically on the idea of being able to discern the times we live in from a biblical larger worldview and uh, understand that we are being conditioned, we are being set up to be deceived for a um, world, one world leader that the Bible says is going to be, be the global leader in politics, in finance, and in religion. Now, in order to combine these three huge subjects and bring them together, this man has got to be extraordinarily deceptive very cunning, very alluring, very charismatic, and somehow has got to pull in all religious worldviews to accept him as a man of peace. So how on earth can all this be done? With massive conditioning. 
And I'm going to be talking about some of the conditioning tools, which is just a few of the movies that um, I focus in on. And the conditioning tools are being used not only in politics, as Michael very clearly worked out, and just one concept of the environment, but also in schools, in medicine, in our churches, which to me is the greatest concern because our churches should be a safe haven, that we think that we're going in to learn truth. And truth, hopefully, based on biblical values, God's values, but as those get shifted with this social gospel and the liberal gospel and the leftist gospel sweeping through our churches, Christians are just falling prey. And this is one of the things that the Bible said would happen in the last days, that there would be an apostasy, a falling away, where the faithful are going to be seduced. And how can that be done? By setting together a new faith. If we're going to fall away from the faith, what is the faith? The faith, according to a Barna poll, um, a 2003 Barna poll, they gave a biblical worldview. This is what they defined as a biblical worldview. Belief that absolute moral truth exists as defined by the Bible. I want us to really think on these things because this is where we're shifting. This is where the shift comes. That Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. Number two of a biblical worldview. Number three, that God is the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe. Number four, that he still rules the universe today. Number five, that salvation is a gift from God and cannot be earned. That Satan is real is number six. That a Christian has a responsibility to share their faith in Jesus Christ with other people, number seven. And lastly, that the Bible is accurate in all of its teaching. Now that's what the George Barna poll went out and then they polled various people um, and they wanted to work out where Christians stood in this. According to the Barna poll, only 9% of those claiming to be born again Christians have a biblical perspective on life. That's very scary. 71% of Christians are falling away from this biblical worldview. The conditioning has already set in, it's in our churches, and we have to come back to our absolutes. I'm making a new film which is due out in a couple of years on our postmodern church, postmodern Christianity. In order to understand postmodernism, we have to understand what modernism is. Postmodernism is a fall away. That's what our generation, that's what the last three, four, five generations are coming out of the school system, out of the 60s with no Bible in the schools. And that's the type of person that's coming into our churches. Modern view held to many of these biblical concepts, not the Jesus Christ part of it, but the idea that there is one God, one power, whether we see it as That also, in a modern worldview, was that there was a supernatural world. All cultures across the universe admit that there is a supernatural world that exists, and there is a conflict between that supernatural world and human beings. Now, the postmodern view where people, the church, has been raised in the last several decades, actually the last couple of hundred years, there has been an attack on modernity, where we've got philosophers and the traditions of men and psychologists, psychiatrists, the whole psychological field, etc., has been debunking truth, debunking the anchor of reason. Now, if we give up truth and we consider it as being just moral and relative, moral relativism, well, your truth is your truth, it doesn't. You can, you can do that, and as long as it doesn't touch my space, that's okay for you, it's not okay for me. So now we're getting into what Michael was talking about, are these dialectic consensus. 
that is coming up, coming into the church. That you set your thesis, you have your antithesis, and then you have to bring in a synthesis, which is the new world religion, which is going to bring in the Antichrist. And the enemy of this whole concept are Bible-believing Christians, those narrow-minded people, or Jews that stick with a biblical worldview, or fanatical Muslims, and if you hear the news, you'll see that the fundamental Christians are being thrown in with the fundamental Muslims, because there has to be a new synthesis. So anything that is not going along with the big main middle to bring in the global new leader, the man of peace, this man who is going to stand up as God and put himself into the temple of God, this man of, as the Bible says, a man of sinfulness who sets himself up as God in the temple in Jerusalem. So then we get the last piece of the puzzle that Jerusalem is the epicenter of the tragedy that is happening in the world today. And the Muslim world is fighting with the, Jerus with the, uh, the Jews. Jerusalem isn't being given to the Jews. We understand from a biblical perspective that Jerusalem belongs to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to come down and rule in Jerusalem. No wonder this is the epicenter of struggle and fighting today. And if the church doesn't understand that there is going to be a blessed hope in Jesus to return, then what do we live for? We hear things that Michael's saying, which is completely overwhelming, and I speak at youth groups and with kids that have absolutely no blessed hope, no idea of what they're living for, don't know who they are. So no wonder they turn to Harry Potter magic because they want to have control of their life and control of their environment because something inside of them is saying this doesn't make sense, we're having to give up our individuality, we're having to give up our rights, what are we going for, we're, we've got to be part of the big human blob and they want power to fight through this. So then they turn to magic and a pagan worldview. so it is all being set up. But just so that we can understand what are these two worldviews so that we can keep them distinct in being able to discern our times. Um, I'm going to just very, very roughly quickly go through them. I was born and raised in India, as Dr. Stan said, and the results of putting nature and loving nature above mankind can be seen in India, tragically. I love India. I was fifth generation born there. The only thing is my skin color gives me away, but I'm at heart an Indian that just loves my friends who are fellow Hindus, fellow Muslims. Um, that is not the issue, but there is a religion and a culture in India that just kills the human spirit and the human heart, bringing in so much apathy that these people just don't know what to do with their lives unless they connect to materialism or the West. The idea of Hinduism is that the natural world is an illusion, doesn't exist. The breakdown is coming with a lot of things that Michael said this morning, that if you realize that our individual property, our humanness, our individuality doesn't exist, then we are being broken down. This is not a good place to be in. Biblically, the natural world is a reality. We do have rights, we are human individuals, and that is the reality. Also, Eastern mysticism, the pagan worldview, says that everything evolved. It evolved with the vibration, the om sound, which actually one gets into even in yoga, getting back to your oneness with the big omness, with the big higher consciousness of nothingness, voidness, which the Bible explains is the very void before God breathed into man, is what the exercise of yoga ultimately gets you to try and get back to, that death state. Whereas the Bible says that God created, he is the creator. Everything he created is good, therefore there must be an enemy that is out to destroy what he is doing. Which means that there is an actual Satan. Just as there is an actual personal God, we have to see that there is an actual personal enemy of God. How did the Satan come into the universe? Biblically we're told, he was created handmade by the hands of God as every angel was created. They did not procreate, and I explain all that in my uh, DVD, Supernatural Powers, The Battle Between Good and Evil, the history of the satanic, of the, of the angelic, the supernatural world, 
so that we can understand that two-thirds of the angels, according to scriptures, stayed under the authority of God. One-third of them were persuaded by Satan that Satan was the equivalent of God. He was made perfect. He was, he was, with, he was perfection, and yet some kind of iniquity triggered in him to decide that he could ascend to be like God, that he would take the glory of God, that he would sit in the high place made for God, that he would take a third of the angels to, to submit to him, and hence became, began the rebellious, the rebellion world in the supernatural world. Jesus says he saw Satan kicked out like lightning, falling from heaven, and came to this world. So he has been given the title of the God of this world, the ruler of the power of this world. So when we see this type of sustainable stuff that is happening politically and all the other things that are happening, we have to understand that there are powers and principalities behind the working of men. Paul says in the scriptures that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities that position themselves in the hearts and minds of men if we don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if we're not plugged into him having died for us, connected us back to God outside of our sin natures, and he gives us all authority to overcome all powers, give us discernment, good thinking, sensible wisdom, so that we can be able to discern right from wrong. So in supernatural um, powers, the battle between good and evil, that lays out what happened in the supernatural world and that how they are out to attack, steal, destroy, kill. Those are the titles given to Satan. Destroyer, thief, um, everything that comes with a rebellious nature, hating God, attempting to lift himself up as God. So once we understand those two worldviews, now in Hinduism, Eastern mysticism, they do not see the satanic world as Satan's world. It is a world of spirits, some of who are good and some of who are bad. So there we get the identification of good magic versus black magic, that you can use spiritual powers for good and healing and not for this. We have to remember that the scriptures tell us that the source of that power is Satan himself who can appear as an angel of light so no wonder his ministers are ministers of righteousness and can be in the church with a false gospel, a false Jesus, a false spirit if they are submitted to the white side of Satan that can then go all to the, this side of the gamut, to the dark side of Satan who is described in the Bible as the dragon, the demon of old, the snake. So then we get the snake that comes up to Adam and Eve, the most perfectly made, handmade creatures from God, once again without sin. And the serpent that was made by God, the most cunning of all creatures, was able to manipulate a perfect person. How much more vulnerable are we, who are now sinners? We can be manipulated. We need to understand that we are extremely vulnerable unless we come back to the word of God, which is absolute truth, and make our opinions in line with the opinion and heart of God. We cannot rest on human understanding and human reasoning, because that's what Eve did. And the serpent said to her, surely God hasn't said, which then got her to think, that's, that is always a process, bad process, I love to think, but we have to think within the context of the Bible. Had Eve said to Satan, you know what, I don't understand why God said that we could eat of absolutely every tree but not this one, why don't you go and talk to him? We probably wouldn't, I mean, goodness knows what's going to, what would have happened, I don't know. But she got into dialogue with him through her imagination, using her imagination, because then he said, surely that fruit which she saw, and by the way she added to scripture because he said, has God said you can't eat? She then added to scripture and said, and God said we couldn't touch, a lie. So we have to know our scripture well enough to be able to do what Jesus did in the wilderness which was come back with accurate scripture when we're involved in spiritual warfare. Then the cunningest creature in all the world said to her, 
This fruit will help you have wisdom and be like God. She fell for the lie. She couldn't be more like God. She was created in perfection. She was without sin. She was created in his image. She wasn't God, but she was given every privilege in her divine nature. She couldn't get any better in the sense of she was the best. God said she was good. She fell for the lie. She used her imagination. She looked at the fruit and saw it was good to eat. Now that was a click into imagining that what she saw could be a benefit to her flesh or wisdom, spiritual enhancement, whatever. This is the trigger that is used in fantasy literature today. This is the use that our children are being used to, to indoctrinated condition to use their imagination. Every argument about Harry Potter will always be, well, it's good for them to use their imagination. But let's go back to the scripture. Never in the scripture is the use of imagination a good thing. Because imagination exalts us into a spiritual realm to have wisdom above what God has allowed us to have with his revealed truth in the scriptures. So we have witchcraft and paganism exalting imagination, exalting human reasoning, exalting self. Whereas the biblical worldview says that there is no good thing in us. Jeremiah 17 says our hearts are deceptively wicked. There's no good thing in us. To look within for God is not the answer. To look within for the divine spark, to look within for human reasoning, to be able to uh, achieve anything is not where the answers are. We have to look to the creator God and his word. So here are the two differences. Within Eastern mysticism, God is an energy. A biblical worldview is God created energy. It's going to have to wind down. Satan is only created. So to, to imagine that God consciousness or energy is part of divinity is, is not a biblical context. The word is lifted up as a person in the scripture. The word became flesh so that we could understand the word and it was full of grace and truth so that we could comprehend it through revelation from the Holy Spirit not through the Eastern concept of going within and connecting to the consciousness. Truth is absolute within a biblical worldview. Within Eastern mysticism, it's based on evolution. Evolution is ever shifting and ever evolving. Therefore, moral relativism, which is what our children are being taught in school today, is all based on the worldview, on the faith, on the, the basis of Eastern mysticism, of evolving, that we're all getting higher somehow. Whereas you look at the Bible that says that everything is going to get worse and worse and worse before the Lord returns. So when the churches are saying that there is revival and huge things happening, we've got to think, what kind of gospel is that connected to? Is it the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, the revelation of a personal relationship with Jesus? Or is it on the mega churches, the new idea, the, the Rick Warren peace plan movement that is connected in with the United Nations peace agenda and all these other things? And just, we have to use our minds sharply to understand why would something like Rick Warren's purpose-driven church, purpose-driven life, purpose-driven ma um, marriage be doing so well? Because God's, God's word isn't. So what, what, you know, what's happening here? It's another agenda. It's part of the sustainability that Mike was talking about. It's reconditioning new think, new movement, new consensus. And one breaks down into small cell groups in the emergent church to see, let's dialogue about God's word. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? Let's have a, the facilitator is there. He's not the preacher. He's not going to the word of God. Let, let's see how we feel about the scripture. Well, look what happened when Eve felt about the apple. And when Eve spoke to that serpent, we got into big trouble. Every other world religion considers the serpent to be the source of wisdom. 
Serpent power is to be awakened within one, and the serpent certainly does have wisdom, because God said in Genesis, the most cunning, the most wise, the most subtle. His agenda is to destroy us. So when you get something like Harry Potter, and I made a film there on Harry Potter witchcraft repackaged, what was the purpose of Harry Potter coming into our school system? Bibles have been thrown out because they're religious. Harry Potter is a witch. The first time in the world we've got child-friendly witchcraft being taught in the classrooms. Under Scholastic Inc., the publishers of 80 years of curriculum in public school bring in a religious book. Uh, Scholastic Inc. come under the umbrella of AOL. AOL allows the kids to go into the computers in the classroom, speak to actual witches about the books that they're reading. The witches answer them, give them a pagan worldview as an answer. I'd just like to ask us if, if this happened in our classroom with born-again, Bible-believing Christians able to be plugged into in the classroom by our kids with, let's say, the Left Behind series of Tim LaHaye or something, which was at the same time that J.K. Rowling's <coughs> um, Harry Potter books were number one bestsellers, so was Tim LaHaye's uh, bestseller. So if the agenda is reading, why couldn't both those books have been put into the classroom at the same time? The agenda was not reading. The agenda was to change the worldview to new think with our kids. What was the new think? Were all the kids going to become witches? No. So many Christians say, well, my, my kid reads Harry Potter and they're not a witch. Let's look at the worldview. Harry Potter's worldview is based on Harry Potter. First of all, he's a witch. What does God say about witches? Witchcraft is this, as the sin of rebellion. You've got 350 kids going to Harry Potter's occult school of witchcraft and wizardry. Nine occult, student, uh, nine occult teachers teaching 350 students various different teachings in occultism from astrology, crystal gazing, tea leaf reading, uh, belief in the dead, belief in apparitions, shape shifting, all the things that, that actual adults, whether they're Satanists or Wiccans, learn in their religion. Now being brought down into child-friendly religious format. What is the pagan worldview? Relative truth. There's no such thing as truth. When Harry steals and Harry lies and Harry does anything wrong, he is rewarded because the means justifies the end because Harry is using good magic. The evil Lord Voldemort is using bad magic. Both of their sources come from, both of their magic comes from the same source, the phoenix feather that belongs to the school's headmaster. It's a pagan worldview that has been given to them, shifting absolutes, moral relativity, that the end justifies the means, that good is evil, evil is good. If it's done by Harry, it's okay. If it's, if it's done by the evil Lord Voldemort, it's not good. Kids are getting confused. The, thesis, the antithesis, therefore let's get together and discuss this, how do you all feel? The kids are then bust on our taxpayer money on yellow buses to go to the movies. Warner Brothers owns AOL and Scholastic Inc. So the indoctrination process continues. There are seven books. J.K. Rowling, the author of Harry Potter, said it would take seven years to build a wizard. So now we've got young 11-year-old kids or 9-year-old kids, and if they can't read, by the way, those, the books are on cassette tape so they can listen to them. An entire generation of our kids have been taken into moral, alternative thinking, new think, new consensus, so that they can be conditioned for the global worldview. Let's take that one step further. The Bible says that when the Antichrist sets himself up on the, on the throne of God, that he is going to demand all the people remaining on earth to take the mark of the beast on their foreheads as a mark of allegiance to him. How can the whole world be conditioned to take on a mark? I mean, I wouldn't take on a mark. I, mean, I don't know how many of you in this room would, but how can the conditioning process begin? Halloween is when Harry Potter's book opens up. Number one festival within paganism, witchcraft, Satanism. It's the end of the old year, the beginning of the new year. 
It's a highlight in the pagan calendar, in the nature calendar. Harry Potter books elevate nature, environmentalism, Wiccan pagan holidays. It opens on Halloween night. Halloween in most places around the world has to have blood sacrifice because the god of death, the, the god of Halloween, Samhain, is the god of death. Go into any store, look at Halloween stuff. I mean, that is not life-giving symbols. Skeletons, tombstones, horror, blackness, black cats, all of these are part of death symbols. Halloween is the festival of death. Opens up, Harry Potter's mother and Harry Potter's father are both witches. The evil Lord Voldemort comes in to kill Harry Potter and the Potter family. His mother gives his life for his son. That is part of Eastern mysticism where the matriarchal figure is greater than the patriarchal in the worldview, in biblical worldview, that we have God our father. Within Eastern mysticism, it's God our mother. You can see that the environmental movement is conditioning us to lift up Mother Goddess, nature worship. Uh, in India, the land I grew up and loved so much as I say, the rivers were Mother Goddess, the map of India is Mother Goddess. You go into the river to live, to die, to shampoo your hair, clean your teeth, wash your bull, your cows, wash your dishes, die in there, have babies in there. It all merges in with chaos and disorder and is all part of goddess movement. So here we have Harry Potter's mother who gives her life for Harry, a complete reversal of where we have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, giving his life for us so that we can become one with God the Father. So Harry Potter's mother gives her blood for Harry, and as this skirmish goes and the evil Lord Voldemort kills Harry's mother and father, he zaps Harry with a lightning bolt, the mark of uh, uh, the god of Thor, the god of power and thunder, onto Harry's forehead. Harry has the lightning bolt, which interestingly enough is also the, the symbol of the swastika, and Hitler, of course, used that as part of his uh, good life because he was an occultist and, and obviously plugged into the occult, and etc., etc. Not to deviate, Harry puts a mark on his forehead. Hundreds and thousands of children all around the world to show their allegiance to Harry Potter at every movie that comes out, every book signing that comes out, put the mark of the beast on their foreheads. The book has been translated into over 63 languages in over 200 countries. We have got global children conditioned to take on a mark on their foreheads. That's another interesting part of the conditioning going on. So, the idea of sin is a biblical concept. We have been separated from God through sin, through uh, Adam and Eve's rebellion. And we need to be connected back to God to have eternal life. Jesus Christ came, the word made flesh, to connect us back for eternal life. In all Eastern mysticism, there is no such thing as sin. It's ignorance of your divinity that keeps you separate from God. So in order to ignite your God consciousness, the divinity within, you have to go into various different altered states, whether it's through drugs, whether it's through yoga. Specifically, yoga and Hinduism are two words synonymous. There's, you can't separate yoga and you can't separate Hinduism. Yoga is a Sanskrit word that means to yoke with Brahman, the big energy, the big consciousness of uh, the, the Eastern, the pagan Eastern mystical idea of God, which is a consciousness and an energy. You ignite, waken up the serpent power within yourself, the wisdom within yourself to connect to God consciousness in yoga. And that is what that's designed for. The incredible thing is how yoga has now come into the church. This is one of the conditioning processes. The, the Hindu Vishva Parishad is a um, Hindu evangelistic Hindu organization. They say that the end of Christianity has come. They, their missionaries, their forerunners are yoga teachers in the West. 
Not that every teacher that does yoga even understands that they are awakening serpent power wisdom to connect to God consciousness within. They think that you can just separate physical exercise and spiritual exercise. It can't be done. When I went to India a couple of years ago to make this movie, I interviewed Hindus that practice yoga, do yoga, and asked, can physical exercise be separated from the spirituality of yoga? It can't, because the idea in Hinduism is that we're all divine. That we, that the animals are divine, nature is divine. That's why the environmental movement is so, such a dangerous movement in the sense of it, again, it's a conditioning process of the divinity of nature. That nature is grander, that animals are grander than human beings. Therefore, uh, one goes out to save a whale, but not a baby in the womb, because the whale has more importance than the baby in the womb. I mean, it's, it is an absolute b bizarre place that we have elevated nature and um, animals higher than human beings. But that's all part of evolutionary thinking. If one sees the idea of creation when Adam and Eve sinned, God brought in the first action of death. He killed an animal, probably a lamb, as a foreshadowing of covering Adam and Eve to show that Jesus Christ was going to be the Lamb of God. So when John the Baptist came, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, it was a foreshadowing. Evolution teaches that death came before life. Death, life, death, life, death, life. Therefore it belittles the idea of death and the blood sacrifice. If we understand that this is not in the classroom a battle between sciences, it's a battle between faith and faith. The faith of Hinduism and Eastern mysticism versus the faith of creationism and God our creator that specifically brought death in, which was because of man's sin. It was not designed like that. So we are not related to apes and birds and, and gone up the evolutionary cycle to eventually become a higher cosmic blob through evolution. It is that, that is a pagan worldview. But when that comes into the churches with the idea of this Christian yoga, which is now, and you will, you will see, I mean, I interview Christians doing yoga in the sanctuaries of the churches and how they justify and have turned around the terminology to bring in from the antithesis to the synthesis and come into this, I mean, uh, thesis to the antithesis, to bring in the synthesis of we are now in the presence of God. So what Christians are being taught through contemplative prayer, again, an Eastern mystical um, uh, part of the whole ecumenical move, as Michael mentioned this morning, coming into the churches, to bring in mysticism and Christian mysticism to dilute and pollute the Word of God, the authority of the Word of God, the power of the Word of God, so that we now become these sort of bland ecumenical uh, Christians that are feeling God, uh, sensing God, sensing the presence of God, and doing the types of exercises within Eastern mysticism where you visualize Jesus in your forehead, in, in your mind, they're again going to the Eastern concept of imagination and visualization. That you can now visualize Jesus when you're in your yoga position or conjure up God, which we can't do. It's the same as idolatry. It's the same as making uh, idols with stones and wood to be able to conjure up the image of God in your forehead to be manipulated to do what I want him to do when I want him to do it which is the complete opposite of thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we have to see the greater merger of the world views that is taking place and particularly the danger when it comes into the church. I wrote this, I wrote this book called um, Gods of the New Age quite some time ago and I'm going to just bring up in, because the Gods of the New Age is actually a really good overview of how Hinduism, Eastern mysticism, being cleaned up, called the New Age, now being cleaned up and called the emergent church that goes back into the church, regurgitated 
and uh, presented as being part of uh, Christianity. But in uh, one of the chapters that talks about um, lessons to be learned, I mentioned that this is one of the things that came out of Dr. Pierce, a professor of education and psychiatry at Harvard University. He made this statement, every child in America entering school at the age of five is mentally ill because he comes to school with certain allegiances towards our founding fathers, towards our elected officials, towards his parents, toward a belief in a supernatural being, toward the sovereignty of this nation as a separate entity. It's up to you teachers to make all of these sick children well by creating the international child of the future. Now this is the agenda in our schools and specifically in our churches which are being used through uh, the Rick Warren thing and I, I'm not sure I've got enough time to cover that today but uh, you can certainly come into my website and go into my Rick Warren's peace plan and how it dovetails with the United Nations. So we have a religion for a new age published in the humanist. It says the battle Quote, the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as the proselytizers of a new faith. The classroom must and will become an arena of conflict between the old and the new, the rotting corpse of Christianity and the new faith of humanism. We take that, and I'm, I'm going to end this up with something that the United Nations wrote, 1947. I haven't got this one memorized, but here we, in 1947, um, Julian Huxley wrote a book titled UNESCO, Its Purpose and Its Philosophy. Quote, and all of this is part of George Hegel's dialectic process that was touched on today in the idea of synthesizing. Quote, the task before UNESCO is to help the emergence of a single world culture. It's interesting that the new Christianity that has been birthed in the last 20 years by the Doug Padgett's, the Brian McLaren's of this world is called the emergent church. This is UNESCO language in 1947, to help the emergence of a single world culture with its own philosophy and this is my opinion in here, what better people to use than the Christian church to become the facilitators of the emergence of a new global philosophy because they are ideal, they want to help AIDS victims, want to help HIV all over the world, rushing to become the missionaries, the new slaves of the new world order, and then not allowed to mention saving grace of Jesus Christ or the gospel where Jesus said, go out and make disciples. This is our mission, to get people to understand that we can have eternal life through what God has done for us and how Satan separated us from that. We need to do that. So there's no point cleaning up the, the lost. We have to help them be found again. So we've got uh, the UNESCO is to help the emergence of a single world culture with its own philosophy and background of ideas and with its own broad purpose. This is opportune since this is the first time in history that the scaffolding and the mechanisms for world unification have become available. And it is necessary for, at the moment, two opposing philosophies of life confront each other from West and from East. And this is going to be the new, new age, new Christianity, new Christian thought, new postmodern Christian for the postmodern thinker. And of course, we know what postmodern is. You may categorize the two philosophies, he continues in the UNESCO uh, philosophy, you may categorize the two philosophies as two supernationalisms, or as individual versus collectivism, or as the American versus the Russian way of life, or as capitalism versus communism, or as Christianity versus Marxism. Can these opposites be reconciled? This antithesis be resolved in a higher synthesis. I believe not only this can happen, but that through the inexorable dialectic of evolution, it must happen. In pursuing the same, we must issue dogma, whether it be theological dogma or Marxist dogma. East and West will not agree on a basis of the future if they merely hurl at each other the fixed ideas of the past. 
for that is what dogmas are, the crystallizations of some dominant system of thought of a particular epoch. A dogma may of course crystallize tried and a dogma may of course crystallize tried and valid experience, but if it be a dogma, it does so in a way which is rigid, uncompromising, and intolerant. If we are to achieve progress, we must learn to uncrystallize our dogmas. Hence, the new wibbly-wobbly, gray, untruth that our kids are involved in. Today, the Hegelian dialectic has become the cornerstone not only of the global education system, but of quality management in all kinds of governmental corporation and private organization around the world. Meanwhile, the training programs, assessment technology, and data tracking systems that complement and monitor the psychosocial process are growing increasingly. And let me tell you that in government, in medicine, in schools, yoga is coming in. What is the point of yoga? It is to help our children get into an altered state of consciousness. They have to give up their minds, which is a breaking of the first commandment that says we have to love the Lord our God with all our mind. Yoga says, put your mind in neutral, feel the presence of God, feel within yourself, go within yourself, breathe. So there's a self-hypnosis in there, an altered state of consciousness and a new worldview because yoga will take them to uh, fellow believers that believe in either, you know, the vegetarianism, veganism, which is all part of Eastern mysticism, that you are what you eat, therefore you don't eat the things that you don't want to be, and then they, you know, it's, it, that's, that's a whole other thing for another day. I think, Dr. Stan, I've come to the end of my time. <laughs>